our invited speaker, uh, Dr. Menon Ress, on strategies for promoting open access in a global context. Um, and as she will tell us about a proposal that's being prepared within the World Trade Organization, um, which is about social or public goods. And this, well, this, 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 this got me thinking, it provokes lots of questions about what, what kind of good is information actually? Is the private good or is the public good? And if it's a public good, then you immediately have a free rider problem. So how do you uh, initiate or promote open access in this, in this global world? Because there's, there has to be an incentive. Um, and this, this reminds me actually of this, this sketch by, by Arlo Guthrie, Alice's Restaurant, where he says, well, if, if, one, people, if one person does it, you know, he's just really sick. And if, if two people do it, uh, okay, they're perhaps both faggots. And if three people do it, then you have an organization. And if 50 people do it, 50 people, can you imagine? Then it's a movement, and that's what it is. And well, perhaps open access may be a movement. And Manon Rest is going to tell about strategies for promoting open access in this global context. Uh, she's a director of uh, Information Society Projects at Knowledge Ecolo Ecology International, uh, which is a non-government organization with offices uh, in Washington, D.C. and Geneva. Um, please, Manon Rest, the, the floor is yours. And I hope our speaker, yeah, you're already there. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, whoops. You can all read uh, my uh, resume, but one thing that it doesn't say is that I hang out mostly in Geneva at the WTO, the World Trade Organization, or at WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, where I hang out with uh, delegates. And one thing I should say is that you librarians are a tough crowd and uh, pretty awesome. Uh, weather like this in London, I would see all the delegates out of here. But you're getting coffee and candy and you're, you're still here. Uh, you're tough in many, many other ways too, uh, obviously. Uh, you are, uh, from what I hear since uh, yesterday, not only curators and providers of knowledge, but you're also uh, creators, consumers, um, it's, it's quite, a, quite a, a feast for me to, to hear so much about what you do. Um, but today, I, I would just tell you that the strategies for promoting open access in a global context, really today I want, I want to focus on one strategy, one uh, kind of narrow strategy actually, for open access uh, to more public good, to more knowledge public good, and in a context that's very specific, the trade context. Um, so uh, I'm gonna cover what are pu uh, global public knowledge good, how to make them globally accessible, and how can we use the trading system. So what are knowledge goods? You know all what knowledge goods are, of course. Uh, I won't insult you with details, but I will uh, show you a slide that um, express my, uh, my wonder about if there's any kind of one definition of what knowledge is. So it could be science, it could be information, it could be learning, and so on. Or Herbert Spencer is a philosopher from uh, England, actually, from the 19th century. Salzberger is an, um, the editor of the New York Times, was the editor of the New York Times. And Abigail Adams is one of my great heroes. She was the uh, wife of a president of the United States and the mother of a president of the United States. Elizabeth Castor is a journalist. Uh, now, what are public goods? Uh, you also all know what public goods are, but uh, you, you know that uh, one of the definitions that's very popular among open access people, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna refer to Peter Suber, who was mentioned several times, I'm sure. Um, he, he, he talks about the public social goods definition in the technical sense used by some economists and he says the public good is a non revalorous non-excludable. It's undiminished, undiminished by consumption. We can all consume it without depleting it or becoming rivals. Uh, he talks, uh, his example is the broadcast. You can listen to a broadcast. It doesn't mean somebody else cannot listen to it. Um, he also says uh, a good is non-excludable 
when consumption is available to all. Um, he, he used as an example air. You can't really prevent people from uh, breathing the air around you. But this is a very narrow definition. I want to mention that uh, for Paul Samuelson, the 50s economist, uh, who's very, very readable and interesting, um, this is an extreme and polar definition of what a pure public good is. He gives an example, Paul Samuelson. He says, imagine a circus and people can look at the circus on top of a hill. And he says, this is an extreme. Most, most things you want are not that easy to get. Uh, so you have to be careful. This is an extreme uh, position definition on the public social good. We have collected a number of definitions, and I invite you to go on the uh, KI Online uh, Note 1790 if you want to see all of them. I won't bore you with that. It's more like a background research. Um, and then there's other definition by Ms. Grave and Steiner, also on our website. I thought that Steiner had a very interesting uh, take on what most people call public good, he calls social goods. Now, I deal with delegates, I need with politicians, and a little bit like uh, we heard at the uh, copyright workshop, sometimes politicians don't really understand what we're talking about. We had a great workshop on that. But uh, when you talk about um, public goods, most politicians understand, they're for it. You talk about social goods, they're starting to think, are you a communist? And so you have to be careful, and depending on who you talk to, you're going to use public or social goods. That's why with you guys, I'm going to use public slash social goods for a while. I don't know. So uh, for our purpose here today, uh, let's make it clear. The definition of public social goods includes production and access to knowledge, provision of security, humanitarian services, public health programs, protection and enhancement of the environment, and promote and programs to promote development. And this is very broad, of course, and you all are more uh, focusing on knowledge goods, but you have to understand that global public goods include security, includes uh, what, uh, what the Red Cross is doing in Nepal, um, include uh, anti-piracy um, uh, provision. And that's to give you a context, because if we want to uh, use the trading system, we can't just be too narrow. However, I think you all agree with me that there is an undersupply of public goods, uh, particularly when the benefits are global. And uh, I understand the chair wants to uh, address the free riders problem. It is a big problem, and that's why we have to address it uh, uh, clearly. Some countries are willing to share some, but not all, of the cost of the supply of certain public good. And here in the land of BBC, I would say BBC makes his program available, I think, to people who are citizen of the UK, right? I mean, I can't get it, really. So it's, it's a cost issue for them. They, they want you know, to, public, to, to provide it to their own public. And librarians are a little bit like that, too. I mean, in general, you don't produce tall global public goods, right? Basically, there's a lack of confidence that other governments will fund projects over time. You never know, they change all the time. This politician can say, I want to provide this, and the next politician is providing nothing. Um, a few examples of uh, public, global public good that we are dealing with in my organization, it's, uh, for example, R&D for new antibiotic drugs. It is definitely, uh, um, it should be a public uh, good. Um, emergency service, we don't deal with that, but I have a son working for the Red Cross in Nepal today, and <laughs> I'm telling you he's uh, providing this service internationally. Um, anything that cross border, basically, is, is, uh, is a global public good, in, potentially. Uh, somebody talked about climate change and natural resources. All these things are actually better off if they're global. If you have pollution, uh, it's no, no good to clean up just one, one side of the river. Um, and more to uh, what you guys are all doing, um, R&D to develop inexpensive refreshable braille readers make a lot of sense if it's a global public good. 90% of the uh, blind people live in developing countries. They certainly don't have the, the means to uh, produce inexpensive refreshable braille readers. Funding the development of open journal, and this is really what, uh, what concerns a lot of people here, and databases, textbooks, and distance education tools are also, of course, um, 
good examples. So a little bit of uh, uh, more specificity of knowledge goods. Uh, as you all know, um, the marginal cost of production is close to zero. And so we could get a lot of them. And I'm thinking, for example, Wikipedia is, uh, is like that. I mean, it does cost money to manage Wikipedia. Um, and they have quite a big of a, a budget with lawyers fighting for their trademark mostly. But the, the, the actual production of the knowledge or the organization of the knowledge is uh, close to zero since they're volunteers. However, as you all know, since you're, some of you are involved in budget and financing, some knowledge goods, especially in science, are expensive to create. And there's a need to create sustainable system of finance for knowledge production. In other words, if we stay with the system right now of uh, uh, production of, um, of knowledge uh, as free or by volunteers or big, because it's uh, human rights, it's, it's kind of a weak system. It's, uh, it depends on the politician, it depends on the good of your heart. So there's a little bit of more teeth if you add the layer of intellectual property rights, and I, I heard quite a bit about copyright as good or bad, or, but basically in this crowd it's, uh, it's a problem, but it's also something that's good. It makes things work, right? Uh, however, for my own purpose, it privatized knowledge and restrict access. Uh, the impact of I IPR, and I'm not just talking about copyright, patent rights are, are pretty, pretty uh, problematic for uh, scientific uh, knowledge too. Um, they have an impact on the prices, and because they have an impact on prices of, uh, of knowledge goods, there's inequalities of access and financial hardship. So the monopolies on knowledge are justified uh, under the IPR system by the need to pay for, uh, for investment risk and R&D. And really, when you think about the Red Book, I don't know if, if any of you use the Red Book. It's a very American way to, we have a book that uh, has all the drug prices list in the US and we use it a lot in our work for access to medicine. The Red Book on drug prices is actually $1,200 a, a year to, to, to buy. Okay, so now this is where you're supposed to laugh because this is a good cliche. <laughs> the secret to change is to focus all uh, of your energy not on fighting the old, but building the new. And this was pronounced by uh, Nick Nolte, you know this actor, who plays the washout um, uh, gas station guy who is uh, uttering great cliche that everybody loves. And it's based on the way of the peaceful warrior, also a pop, pop culture icon that you intellectual librarians don't probably read. But I like this cliche because it's uh, totally appropriate for what I'm talking about. So I would like to talk to you about what we should do to have more global public good, such as the one that I described before, and many more, of course. Uh, we can do the hand-to-hand -hand combat and increase public sector investment, and you go to your MEP or your uh, education minister and you ask for more public sector investment. You can uh, create new incentives for reform, um, and the Open Access uh, Journal, for example, address that issue quite a bit. And also, you can address cross-border and trade-related issue of knowledge produced as a public good, and this is what's interesting because our proposal is a hack of the WTO. The WTO is a beautiful building uh, in Geneva. Here's a picture of it. It's uh, right on the lake, has a beautiful view, as you can tell. And this is what we call the World Trail Organization. I don't want to be insulting, but in case you don't remember, it's, uh, it was created in the 90s. It has now, as of uh, this year, 161 countries. It has a, a big staff of six, 640, but there's actually more. Uh, a Brazilian DG, Roberto Azevedo, and it has many functions, such as uh, uh, administering the trade agreements. It provides a forum for trade negotiation, resolves trade disputes, monitor national trade policy, provides technical assistance and training, and uh, cooperates with other international organizations. According to them, they do even more. This is on their website, and in case you think you don't fit in the WTO program, everything fits under the WTO program. You can get agriculture, anti-dumping, balance of payment, cost and valuation, GATT, and I, I, this is the goods, 
but then you have the services, and you guys would be in that column, which is kind of small because they made it as the GATS. It's the General Agreement on Trade Services. And then you have intellectual property, and you definitely would fit in there too. And uh, for example, you have the uh, intellectual property and public health, and you probably heard quite a bit about that. And then you have this column over there, other topics. You know. And then, more importantly, the smallest one, it's usually the smallest one or the footnotes, right? Dispute settlement. Because whatever you talk about at the WTO, the difference is that it has teeth. So when I have to explain to, uh, to some people what the WTO is, I say it's a marketplace, it's a forum for trade, and it's about enforcement and dispute resolution. It's a forum for trade. Imagine here you all have cards and you decide, I give you this if you give me that. I give you textile if you give me your agriculture. I give you IP, I give you textbook, or I give you distance education. It's the same thing, it's all about trade. And the big difference is that there's enforcement which means if you make a commitment to trade something, you better do it. And that is the, what's unique about the WTO, and that's why what I'm telling you is probably really annoying and disturbing to you, because it is about being mean about what you want and what you want to get. It's about commitment, binding commitment. It's about uh, imposing trade sanction if you don't do the right thing. So the sanction may take the form of tariffs on selective or targeted goods, and also other measures, including the retaliation against IPR. I don't know if you remember what happened to Aruba. Aruba was in dispute with the US about uh, online gambling, and uh, they decided to, uh, to bring it to the WTO, and the US, and they refused to pay any copyright uh, a fee for movies and music to the U.S. industry until the online gambling was solved. The U.S. could afford it, so that was not a big problem. There was also the music industry here in Europe with the Irish musician, and for the French, because there's a lot of French here, and I'm French after all. Uh, I don't know if you remember how Roquefort was, uh, was hit with a 300% tariff and could not be exported to the U.S. because Bush decided to punish Europe, but through Roquefort for not letting um, beef with hormone imported. Um, of course, Roquefort is mostly imported to London, so I don't think it made a big dent in their budget. Now, I have this, uh, this long quote, and I'm not going to read it, but um, some of you might be uh, uh, familiar with La Larry Summers. <laughs> I laugh at La Lawrence. People call him Larry in DC. He's a Harvard professor. And he was a, the Secretary of, uh, of Treasury. He was brought in during the Obama administration. And he's definitely pro-trade, pro-free trade, pro-rich pro people, pro-everything, right? However, however, in June of this year, right uh, during the negotiation on the, uh, the, the Trade Pacific Partnership Agreement, you probably heard of that trade agreement, Larry Summers said something that uh, really showed that there's a momentum to look at the trade, trade um, system differently. Basically, he says, the trade system is not working for our citizens. They're not buying into it. They hate it. And so we have to do something else. We have to start putting things that people care about or the trade system, and that he's referring to a vote that, uh, that didn't work out for people. And there's almost like a social movement around trade that says we want good trade. We want trade that helps us, not trade that hurt us. So that's why I think there's a good, a good time for a proposal for an international agreement on the supply of public goods. And the goal is to create an option for governments to make binding offers and commitments for the supply of diverse global public goods. Uh, a government could decide, you want a, a free trade agreement with me? Well, you're going to have to uh, sign the treaty for, uh, for the blind. You're going to have to implement um, the, the NIH policy of publishing um, all research, um, uh, publicly funded research online. Why not? The U.S. does a lot. Uh, Europe does a lot. Why not? So it would be model uh, on the GATS. I never thought I would say anything positive about the GATS, but here it is. Sometimes the GATS uh, can be uh, a good model. Uh, it's a good model because it's a system of binding offers uh, of very different things. I mean, it's really apple and oranges is almost too, too similar. 
I'm talking about NIH uh, uh, publication versus textile. It's really whatever you want to trade. And uh, strangely enough, no, uh, I ask a delegate, I mean, do you ever not make a commitment? No, that's what they do. They, they, they're a machine of binding commitment. It could be tourism, bank, anything. So why not good stuff? The key to the agreement is the ability to accommodate a diverse set of offers, because when there's a very little chance for, uh, for consensus, that's the only way to do it. So I talk about the hack because that's what we would do. We would use the system that we don't always approve of, but a system that works, that has teeth, that, uh, that goes somewhere, to liber liberalize trade in uh, the supply of public goods. The benefits of a WTO agreements are, are, are very, uh, um, maybe not that interesting to you, but uh, on the one hand, it can replace the need to set up a separate treaty for example, a treaty on access to knowledge could be just be a part of a protocol in a binding agreement, or it can be um, a com complete, uh, completely uh, different uh, treaty or agreement. And I'm thinking uh, uh, the Doha Declaration on Public Health, for example, could be one of the examples here. More benefits, and especially for me, it would change the culture of the WTO. And a little bit as we change the culture of the world intellectual property by introducing a treaty in the public interest, we could change the WTO culture in introducing something that we want. So uh, there would be a shift to consider the competing benefits of greater openness and a larger global commons. Knowledge produced to be free would have a new value as a trading chip in the WTO environment. So moving forward, we have a working group that's been uh, drafting, and there's language, and I'd be happy to share it with anybody who's interested. And the, the last expert committee that met in uh, Berlin uh, decided that they wanted to have different stakeholders draft different commitment that would work for them. So um, they asked medical research people, environmental people, who are very interested, of course, because there's a lot of trading in environment, humanitarian, piracy, and so on. But I think that for the research librarian, if you could identify and communicate uh, what could be a standardized com commitment that would benefit your openness agenda, it would be very useful. And I was thinking, for example, in, in the UK right now, you have this 100,000 genome project, uh, and which is going to be uh, controlled by libraries, I believe. And it's, a, it's an absolutely great project. Is it going to be global? Is it something that you think should be global? Um, I would be very interested in hearing from you about what you think should be a global public good. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Well, if, if it, it sounds exciting to have a hack on this WTO um, agreement. Uh, how, uh, could you give us some idea how it would, would look like for open access? Okay, so some, uh, for open access, it's a question of how you, you make the proposal. You have to find a country that will um, put it on the table, right? So uh, a little bit like the Doha Declaration on Public Health was proposed by Zimbabwe, a small country, just put it on the table. Nine months later, they said, you want your Uruguay uh, round to work, you have to sign this Doha Declaration. That's how it works, right? So for open access, that's what we need. We need some, some country, some member, member uh, states, to say uh, the Uruguay uh, round is going nowhere. As you know, it's a total disaster. But we would accept something if you accept, for example, 1% um, of your, uh, of your um, education budget goes into funding open, uh, open journals. I, I mean, I'm just saying that. You, I'm not a librarian. You tell me what you think should be in a, for open access. I think one of the problems for me, uh, looking at open access journals, for example, is, is how do we fund these things? I mean, it's time consuming, it's complicated. Um, needs a lot of expert, we have to find a way of funding it. And it can be the academic community paying for their own papers, but we saw there's all sort of issues with that. So I'm thinking, how about making a commitment from one country saying, 
if you make your genome, uh, your 100,000 genome thing on the table, and it doesn't have to be for the 161 members, just the people who sign, right? So you could have like Europeans and American, because that's one of the problems. The developing countries don't like the idea of having binding commitments. But I myself think that free writing is not, is not the way to go. If we put our genome on the table, they have to put their genome on the table. But that's, it depends on the countries, of course. That's one, one of the way. Um, I think that if you look, at, since you're more copyright people, if you look at the Berne, the Berne Convention, the quotation was in a way an offer to, uh, to carve out something from copyright to make sure that it would, it would be a public good. Because you cannot share if you don't have the quotation right, right? So it's, it's the same principle. I don't know if I explained it right. I'm trying to find the angle. For you, it's more copyright. So I would say the Berne Convention has an offer in it in our interest, not just the copyright people. It's an exception. They don't like it. Okay. Yeah, Susan? Thanks, Manon. Your talk is quite, I think, mind-expanding for us. Um, and you, you said earlier um, that politicians, when you say social good, they kind of go, oh, yuck, are you a communist? <laughs> well, I think when you say trade to librarians, we kind of go, yuck, <laughs> nothing yes. to do with us. Um, so what are we supposed to do? Because I don't think we, do we just sit back and wait for KEI to kind of, to make your hack in uh, W2EO or, what do librarians working on the ground at institutional level have to do to push their countries to start putting public goods, social goods on the agenda or you know, to put uh, deals which include open access to knowledge uh, at that level? What, what do we have to do? Well, the first thing would be to uh, actually try to create a group and uh, discuss it. Are you interested in working in the trade environment and I agree with you that it's kind of a yucky environment. <laughs> it's not my field at all. But maybe that's why I'm, I'm naive when I go there and I ask them, why do you trade on bad thing all the time? So you, you have to uh, figure out your ask. And then when you have your ask, what we do is we shop around the good countries. I mean, I must say that some, some of our own countries here would not be the, the best candidate. But um, sometimes it's complicated. You, you, you have to go with countries that you might not want to talk to for many reasons. But I mean, it's, it's basically, first thing I would want from you guys is to actually explain to people, like the Berlin expert, what is it that you would want in a, if we could get a global public good? What, what, what is the, the thing that would work for you? Open access? Uh, access to databases. I mean, there are a lot of things that are so costly, but it's ridiculously costly. It, it shouldn't be, right, once it's up there. So what is it that you think as librarian would work for you? Where, where are the problems in, in those frontiers of knowledge, basically? And I think in Europe, uh, you have, you, you're starting to see the, uh, the, the community as more inclusive of exchanges, right? I mean. I, I meet people from all over Europe here. But you have to think that there's a whole world outside of that. The genome of uh, the UK is just a little piece, right? So I think the WTO is, is a place to go. I know that the, for most people, the experience in Brussels doesn't make it very tempting to, to go any further. But I think, <laughs> I think that the WTO is worth it because it has teeth. It's, uh, it, if there's a commitment by a country, it will be enforced. It will be, and right now, the, uh, the copyright owners and the patent owners and, and the pharmaceutical industry, they are at the, at the WTO getting commitments from countries to respect more and more of their higher and higher norms. You know what I mean? So if we don't step in, we, we can't complain. We have to step in. So I, I would welcome any of you to uh, get in touch with me and. Uh, when we have a meeting, we're supposed to have a meeting in the fall, probably in Europe, uh, to talk with environmental people because it seems like they're, they're very active in, uh, in Europe, but I, I think libraries should be in, in, involved too.
because the global public knowledge goods are very important. It's not just the patent, it's the copyright. Okay. Um, any further questions? Ingrid. Is there already an example, a good practice of an agreement that is being under this uh, WTO construction regarding public goods that we can learn from? I think the Doha Declaration on Public Health is probably the best example. Um, it was back in 2001 when uh, the norms for, uh, uh, for patent rights were, were getting really higher and higher. The respect for a lot of the uh, medicine were getting uh, a little out of control. And the developing countries said, well, we have to address our public health issues first, and then we'll look at how to respect your, uh, your intellectual property and your medicines. We want to have generic drugs. We can't do it. We can't wait for 20 years when it becomes generic. So what the um, developing country people did, and it was really the South Center and the um, Third World Network, two NGOs together that work with Zimbabwe to draft language, and it went very fast. In six months, the Declaration on Public Good, which on, on, on uh, public health, was out, and it's on the W2 website. And I don't know if you follow trade agreements, but it's always referred to at the beginning, saying, we have to respect this. We, we can't push uh, uh, LDC, these developing countries, into doing things they can't afford, because their population will die. And that was in 2001. The momentum was the AIDS crisis. And I think a lot of people understood that the AIDS crisis was killing millions and millions of people in Africa. They could not afford to continue that crap. And that's why I say now we might have another momentum for good stuff like this to happen because people are sick and tired of trade that doesn't really benefit them. And especially knowledge. I mean, the cost of education and textbooks and books and is, is just outrageous. So it's time to do it. At the same time, you have the technology that makes it really cheap to produce and easy to access everywhere in the world. So it's a good time to do it, right? It's uh, like Wikipedia, I mean, something like that, I mean, it's an example. But at the WTO, I would say the Doha Declaration is probably the best. Okay, any further questions? Yeah. Could we have the mic over there, please? Yeah. <coughs> I'm just thinking about the time frames um, because you just mentioned that, that example which was quite quick, um, so six months it took to take over. But if we would need to be thinking about what it is we're asking for and what's a, what is a reasonable thing to actually try and achieve within a reasonable time. So if, if we were going to be asking for a certain country to change their copyright laws to allow anything that's publicly funded to be, uh, be permitted to be made openly accessible, which is, of course, ideally a situation. Just having gone through the process of getting some small amendments in Australia, and I understand some amendments here in the UK, it just takes absolutely forever. So, and that's a sort of legal process that, that the WTO can't override. So we would need to think about what it is we're asking for that's actually um, can happen within a reasonable period of time. Does that make sense as a question? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, oh, yeah. It, 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 the time is is getting it's getting longer and longer. Those negotiations are getting tougher and tougher. They meet every 18 months. The next one is in Kenya, so we're not going to make it next time. It's too close, but <laughs> uh, hopefully something will happen. Uh, to give you, uh, for example, in the UK, the TDM uh, negotiation or, or uh, bill could be something that a country say if you give me access. Uh, to, uh, if I can do text and data mining on your things, can you, you do it on mine? I mean, it's, it's, it's a trading thing. It's not about changing the law. That's, it's, uh, it's self-executing. The WTO decide and it's happening. That's why it's quite a different process from WIPO. I just work on the WIPO Treaty for the Blind, and now we're fighting for the implementation of the treaty in every country, in every part of the world. It's a nightmare, right? The Declaration of Public Health, there's this declaration at the beginning of every free trade agreement that country signs, basically, and that's how it would work. So I don't know for, for what, that's why I'm asking you, what would be a, an offer that would work for you? And then, 
you know, it's a question of finding the country. When a country wants to do it, it goes very fast. And they love to do it, to tell you the truth. They love it. They always ask us, well, we love your treaty on access to knowledge, the big treaty, you know, can we get something? So we're like procurement, maybe open source software. You know, I mean, there's, there's, and they love it. They make a binding commitment. There's a, it's funny because in the US, the, the commitments are state by state, basically. So for example, you can be an accountant uh, from Malaysia in Minnesota, but not in Virginia. You know, so it depends. It's like playing card with your kids. You know, everybody has a different deal. So it, it's sort of weird, but it, it, that's why I can't tell you how long it would be. It would be a long time to get everybody on board, but it doesn't have to be. You need a handful of people to do it, and then that works. Like for textile, we don't have the same deal with everybody for textile or agriculture. Wow, especially the European. <laughs> You're tough. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> Any further questions? No? Right. In that case, I'd like to thank, thank our keynote for thank an excellent you. speech. Hello, thank, thank you very much. much.